Let's start with Daryl, who's in Winnipeg. Good evening. My question for David uh, is concerning Coeur d'Alene Mines. Um, I listen to the show every night, and no one ever seems to ask about it. And uh, I've got a half position. I was looking to add more, but it's been uh, struggling a little bit. I don't know if it's because of seasonality or some of the problems they had earlier in Bolivia or if this is maybe uh, being one of the largest silver producers. I would have thought that um, um, it would be a way to play silver, and I wonder if I should maybe be looking at a place like Silver Wheaton instead. Right. So, Daryl, uh, you know, I'll come at this from the way that we look at the world. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking sort of top down at the industry group first to say, is it constructive? And then beyond that, say, within those groups, which are the best companies uh, based on numbers and based on the way that they're trading? And um, certainly, uh, it's interesting, early in the winter, it doesn't really matter where you looked in precious metals, the stock started to underperform. And I think some th people postulated the fact that, that it's highly uh, energy intensive and so high oil prices were very costly and there was concern about costs for a lot of the producers. Um, but nonetheless, the stocks were underperforming. I've always found when the stocks underperform, the physical commodity market's probably telling you something. Uh, and so, you know, you look at Coeur d'Alene and it's had a tough go, but frankly, if you put up almost any other silver company, it's also been difficult. Silver Wheaton's a great company. They've had, they've had a pretty good pullback. So I just think that in general there has been uh, risk accepting money coming out of the market uh, and a lot of the silver stocks have corrected significantly. If you went back to the 1970s and the last really great secular bull market for commodity stocks, you had like four 40 percent corrections along the way. It didn't mean the thing was done, it just meant that they got overcooked. So I think that there was a lot of optimism in the silver market uh, and then of course silver itself came off um, as they raise the margin requirements. So I don't think it's specifically something spe specific about Coeur d'Alene. I think there's a lot of stocks that have corrected in the group. Um, I prefer a silver Wheaton even though it's, it's more expensive. Um, but I will say we have very low exposure to precious metals right now because we do think that uh, they continue to be quite sloppy. I, I can't find many that I would be interested in owning currently. We need to see them do a little more work technically. Do you own silver Wheaton? Uh, we do not. The only precious metal stock we own uh, is Sabina Gold. Sabina. Uh, so we have we have almost nothing in the group, and it's just because it has been an underperforming group. And our belief is we don't we don't get paid to be invested. We get paid to make money. And if the group goes out of favor, well, let's go to the sidelines and wait for better opportunity. Right. There's no momentum there. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. An email from Brian on Halliburton. Uh, what's Mr. Burrell's view on this company? The nefarious Halliburton, some might say. Well, I think there's a lot of people that don't like this company. It is an extremely well-managed business, and they have a, a very dominant market position. Um, coming from the top down, the, the, the oil service group has had a difficult time. Halliburton's behaved extremely well, and I think it's part of the fact that they are focused uh, on uh, liquids-rich uh, gas and oil specifically. That's their, their main target, and those are the two parts of the energy market that have behaved better than certainly dry gas. Uh, and some of the offshore stuff. So, uh, you know, I don't own Halliburton. It's a stock I could own. I think the market favors large cap stocks right now, and uh, given some of the macro concerns out there. So I, I'd have no problem owning the stock. Uh, we'll see whether uh, there's, there's any new strength coming into energy. The one risk, I think, is, of course, companies plan their spending based on the price of or the commodity, and if we believe that the commodity price could be coming off, the whole group could be susceptible. And I do think that there is some risk in oil. There's, there's um, uh, some weakness in the commodity itself. Okay, David, uh, one of our guests yesterday liked this stock from uh, Lisa in Toronto. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Boris. You're my, my all-time favorite analyst. I'd like to thank you for recommending Canfo Pulp. I've been very happy with it. I just would like to have your opinion long-term, short-term, and would it be safe to add to my position? Sure. I'll hang up and listen. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful summer. Thank you very Thanks, much. Lisa. Uh, Lisa, Canfor Pulp is a, is a favorite of ours, and it continues to be a core position in our portfolios. Um, we've spent a lot of time looking for uh, companies that can provide us a yield uh, that is attractive and at the same time give us a little inflation protection, companies that have some pricing power or ability to raise prices if, 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 uh, if uh, there is inflation in the system. Canfor Pulp, of course, in the pulp business, pulp markets are pretty tight. There's very strong demand for pulp, and the pricing has continued to be very strong. So we think it's going to continue to pay a very attractive yield. 
Uh, and so long as the underlying pulp market remains firm, I think it looks pretty good. So, uh, you know, we'll always use a stop on every position, but this is one that I think is, uh, is behaving very well and we get paid along the way. All right, Lisa's done well, and uh, you think she, she should uh, hang in there with uh, Canfor Pulp. Let's talk to Ed, who's in Toronto. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking the call. Um, could you give us your thoughts on Cineplex, please, and how you think it's going to do this year? Thank you. Sure. So Cineplex we really like. This is a, another core position for us. Um, anytime you've got 75% of a market, you've got a pretty good opportunity to make money. Look at that chart. And this has just been a powerhouse for a couple of reasons. One, they've got a dominant market share. Two, there's dynamics in the, in the movie business that make it a good place to be right now because, of course, with all of the 3D movies that come out, there's premium pricing. And uh, they've been able to make a lot of money. The, the, the lineup of new movies to come, there's some blockbusters that come over the summer, which should be really positive. Uh, I, I think that people misunderstood the reason people go to movies. You know, it's not just they're all going to watch them in the house. They like to go out. And then Cineplex seems to be pretty good at taking money out of your pocket once you're in the theater. <laughs> so uh, this is a, a company that we really like. It's well managed. Uh, it's got a strong market position. We get paid a little bit. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a company we're happy owning. And we have the CEO uh, on here on a regular basis, uh, Ellis Jacob, correct? Yes. Yeah. We have him usually around earnings time and uh, for other reasons as well. Let's take a, a short break here. Back with David Burroughs. More of your calls and emails on uh, North American Large Caps after this.